All right, everybody come in and have a seat. Closer to the front as you can. The last group just finished love outside. Y'all did such a good job. Marcos, can you check to see if there's anybody else out there? Just open, just look, you don't have to go outside, just check. Here's the issue with doing the activity first, is that everybody comes back and they're very excited and they don't want to listen. So I'm going to just have a relax, ah, take a deep breath, hopefully you won't go to sleep. But I want to tell you a couple of things. What we're asking for is the adults that were outside, if you could email your pictures to the email address up there. Matt in the back is going to try to put those pictures up on the screen so that after we finish, we can show everybody's pictures and we can have a, a fellowship together. So, let me say this. Let me have everybody's attention. Okay, everybody's attention. One of the things, one of the things that, that we see in the Bible, a lot of times, when we talk about, um, uh, when we refer to Acts chapter 2, we refer to Acts chapter 2, 38. But one of the things that I don't think we talk about enough is what the Bible says in Acts 2, 42. And in a second, I may, I may put it up there. When I, when I, was, when I was talking in uh, FAR a few months back, one of the things that, that Acts 2, 42 says is that that after they have been baptized, after the church has been established, after everything gets started, it says that those who believe, those who are Christians, devoted themselves. Can you have a seat? Wait, sit down somewhere, not on the computer. Please. Can y'all even move down and let him sit down? So he's not tempted to. Okay, ma'am, can you move over a little bit? Let him sit down. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the word of God. They devoted themselves to learning. It also says they devoted themselves to prayer. And we prayed today. And we're going to talk, we're going to look at the word of God right now. And it says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. I'm saying them out of order on purpose, if those of you are looking. The breaking of the bread, I think in that case, actually is talking about partaking of the Lord's Supper. But it can also refer to just eating a meal together, which we're going to go eat together in just a second. But the second thing on that list that it talks about was fellowship. And so one of the things that we want to do, that I like to do, whenever we do these activities, is I want to make sure that we do all four. That we hear, hear the word of God, that we pray, that we can share things together. But number, number two on that list is that we can fellowship with one another. Because when I was here last year, one of the things I talked about was this life is not easy. You don't go through life and everything is just perfect and everything falls into place perfectly. Life can be difficult at some times. And we need each other. We need to know that there's Christians in FAR and there's Christians in Edinburgh. And there's Christians in Brownsville. And there's Christians in Port Isabel. We need to know that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that we can help each other get through this life with. And I want you to get to know each other. This congregation here in, um, in Westlaco, in the summer, they go to a church camp. And they go to a church camp with other churches from up north. If any of you guys are interested in going to a church camp in summer... I think it's a wonderful way to be able to meet people. Liana went this past year, and you were baptized after church camp, weren't you? Just to embarrass to say. But it's a wonderful experience to get to associate and fellowship with other Christians. 
Now, I, 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 I was told we're going to eat in just a few minutes, so I'm going to have to go through my message really fast. Uh, Matt, if you get a chance, can you put me back up on the screen if that's okay? So I'm, I was going to make it a little bit interactive. I'm not going to make it too interactive. I'm just going to I'm going to talk about what I wanted to talk about. So this is the passage that we were looking at a second ago. The last thing that I asked you to do was to form the word love. Don't don't answer the question. But why do you think I chose love? Why do you think I wanted to 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 spell out the word love? Number one reason is because they told me that's the topic they want me to talk about. But it's a love. Well, I'll tell you in a second. In the Greek language, there are four words that are used for love. In English, we really only use one word. I can say, man, I love Juanita. Or I can say, I love my wife. Is that the same thing?
at 17 science teachers. Of the 17 science teachers, 14 of them professed to be Christian. And they had to teach evolution, because if you're old enough and go to high school, you're going to learn about evolution. But evolution, parts of evolution are true, but the evolution that we came from a monkey is totally false. And science can prove that. And I'm getting off topic. I'm not going to talk about that. But if you ever want to know about that, I'll gladly share with you my, 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 my studies on that. But the Bible can be wrapped up in the word of love, because God is love. So, how can we show love to other people? I was going to have you do little groups and you were going to sit and talk to other people, but I got 10 minutes to finish before lunchtime. But I just want you to think in your mind for a second. How can you show love to other people? If you don't know, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Be kind, be forgiving. And also, that means be respectful. So when somebody's talking, you're not playing with each other and doing things that you shouldn't be doing or looking at pictures that we're going to put up in a little bit. That's one way you can show love. And that also means not just for the person who's standing up here, but to your teachers. To the people that you come in contact with, to your parents, to your friends. Be kind, be respectful. Look for their needs above your own needs. Because here's what God, the Bible says. I'm not going to do that after all. The Bible says one of the words in the New Testament that, that is love is a word agape. And agape, a lot of times we'll look at this and we'll say, that's unconditional love. That's the love that God has for us. It doesn't matter if we sin. It doesn't matter when we mess up. It doesn't matter what we do. God still loves us. But love doesn't mean there's an absence of discipline. Because when you love somebody, you discipline somebody. And because God loves you, sometimes he's going to discipline you. So you're not going to have a perfect life just because you go to church. But this word of unconditional love, I was at some lectureships a few weeks ago in Lubbock. And there was a guy who said, a better understanding of this word is the word of priorities. What he means by that is, God's priority is our salvation. God loves us so much that he doesn't care whether you have the newest iPhone or not. He doesn't care whether you wear the fanciest clothes. He doesn't care how much money you have. He doesn't care how important you are. He doesn't care how popular you are. It doesn't really matter to him how happy you are. What matters to him is your salvation. And God is going to do whatever he has to do to get you to realize that you need him. And he does that because he loves you. Because he gave his son to die on the cross for you. Because God's priority is your salvation. And if you go to first, the, the, a lot of this is going to be in First John, the book of First John. If you, if you take away the word God and you take away the word love and you put priorities, you'll understand what God's priorities are. So if that's a good definition, then our priorities in our relationships with people have to be not about whether they like us or not, not about whether they accept us or not, but about their salvation for their soul. And the reason why I was asked to talk about this, and I'm going to skip through this for just a second, was because there was a gentleman, and I don't know if this is being recorded or not, but when I was in high school, in the previous century, somebody said I was over 75. That guy would not check their glasses. Uh, but there was a girl who said I was like in my 40s. That could, you get to go eat first as much as you want, as long as you want, and then you tell everybody else when they can go, okay? No, I'm just kidding. When I was in high school, one of my best friends was a, was a boy named Fernando Sainz. And he, me and Fernando knew each other from fourth grade. And we went through all, we took most of our classes together. In high school, we, 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 we had almost all of our classes together. We played football together, we played basketball together, we ran track together, we did everything. One of our English teachers said to me and Fernando and another guy named Eric Barbosa, she called us the 30 percenters. I don't know why she called us 30 because the three of us were always doing things together. After high school, I went into education. Fernando became a lawyer. 
And we still kept in touch, not as much as we did in high school. But my relationship with, with, with Fernando was about school, was about athletics, was about going out on a Saturday night and doing things. Not bad, but just having, just doing things. But Fernando died. And I sat there at his funeral It was a closed casket. It wasn't here. But he was my best friend, one of my best friends from fourth grade all the way on to, to when he passed away. And I sat in the pew, I sat over there somewhere, and his casket was up here, and his body was so ravaged that they had the casket closed because the family didn't want anybody to see his body. And I sat there and I thought, I never talked to Fernando about God. I never shared with him my salvation. I never shared with him the gift of God, the gift of love that God provides for us. And while everybody else was crying because Fernando was dead, I was crying because I didn't know where Fernando was going. And I could not bear the thoughts of my best friend going to hell. And I'm going to tell you, hell is a reality. And when I looked at his body, I thought, there's nothing I can do for him now except pray for God's mercy. That God would be merciful on him and that maybe he knew and maybe he did things and maybe he was a child of God. But from what I knew about him, I don't know, God's the judge. I don't make those decisions. But I'm going to tell you right now, every single one of you has somebody that you consider a best friend. Every single one of you has somebody who's not here today or who doesn't go to church with you that you really like, that you probably love as a friend. And maybe you do things with them. Maybe you're in a band together. Maybe you're in athletics together. Maybe you have classes together. Maybe you're in ROTC together. Maybe you're doing some of these other things together. And you really love that person. And I'm going to tell you what. There's going to come a time. And I'm, I'm off my notes because I'm, I'm finishing up some time here. My problem was I didn't prioritize. I prioritized other things in my relationship with Fernando. Or Furnace or Fermi. Than his salvation. And so my message to you right now is... I want you to think of one person that you would consider your best friend that is not a Christian. You may be sitting next to somebody and they're my, they're my best friend or they're my boyfriend or they're my girlfriend or whatever. But if they're here right now, at least they're hearing God's word. But if, I want you to think about somebody who is not a Christian. And I want you for as many days as you possibly can I want you to pray for that person's salvation. I'm not going to ask you to go crazy or bring the Bible or, or preach to them or to do any, any kind of thing that takes you out of your comfort zone. But I promise you this. If you pray that God will open up doors for you to be able to talk to them about salvation, God is going to open up doors. And somehow, some way, you're going to have that opportunity. Because if you care about that person, if you love that person, if you prioritize their salvation over all of the other things in this world, then God is going to open the door for you. Because there is going to come a day, and this is the other, this is, I'm going to go through this kind of stuff real quick. We're, we're not going to do any of this. There's going to come a day when Jesus is going to call us all home, everybody. And according to Matthew 25, verse 36, Jesus is going to sit in his glory with all of his angels. And he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Now, I, I think this is figurative. But if it's not, on this day, be a sheep. Don't be a goat. And even if you look like a goat, go to the right. Go to Jesus' right. Because that's what the Bible says. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He's going to separate the saved from the unsaved. 
And if you're the saved and you're going over to this side and you look across the aisle and you see your best friend going to the other side, you're going to realize at that point that they never accepted Jesus Christ. And I would never want that to happen. Thank you. Because whether you believe it or not, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25 that those who do not accept him are not going to be in his presence. And they're going to be in eternal punishment. And those that do accept him as their Lord and Savior and put on Christ in baptism are going to go into eternal life in the presence of God. And I will tell you this. I don't know most of you. I'm getting to know some of you. But I love you as a brother and sister, even you who I just met today, as a brother and sister in Christ, and my priority, because of that love, is to make sure that you go to heaven. Because that's the single most important thing that we can do in this life. When I retired from being a principal, last year, they asked me to go back and speak. They had a baccalaureate ceremony. And all of my students were there. The students that I was, that they were my students when I was a principal. And I got up and I stood up and I told them, I said, for, for almost 30 years, my job was to prepare people, for kids, for life after high school. Because I wanted them to be prepared to, to pursue their dreams. But that night when I got up to him, talked to him at the baccalaureate, what I told him was, I've changed my course. Because now my job is to prepare people for life after this life, which is way more important than your life after high school. So I beg of you, number one, to remain faithful to God, to continue doing what you're doing in building your relationship with God and with fellow Christians. And number two, I, I, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to beg of you to reach out to somebody that you love that you know, that you care about, and bring them into the family of God. And I'm going to tell you this. There are no cards. I put no cards all in the pew in front of you, on the pew on sides, and I put pens. Maybe not too far back. But I will, I'm going to tell you this. I believe in the power of prayer. So I was going to do this as an activity, but my time is up right now. What I want you to do, and I'm not going to go and check if you don't do this. I'll check if my three kids don't do this. But the rest of you, I'm not going to follow up on. But on that note card, I want you at some point, you can do it now if you want to, or you can do it later. I want you to write your name on that note card. And then I want you to write the name of your best friend. And when you're done, either leave the note card on the pew or put it up here, or give it to me. Because I'm going to make a commitment to you that for the next 40 days, that's almost till Christmas, I'm going to pray for you and your friend every single day. I'm going to pull up all of those note cards, hopefully every morning, and I'm going to pray for Abraham and his best friend, George, or go to or Albert, or whatever his name is. I'll answer your question in a second. There's not enough pens and there's not enough papers, but I want you to be committed to that person, and I want you to know that I'm going to be committed to that person. And I promise you, if Wesico lets me come back next year, that somebody that we prayed for, that we talked about, that we were pushing for, will be here with us. Because that's our goal is to bring as many people to Christ as we possibly can. So write it whenever you want. There's pay, there's pens, there's, there's all this kind of stuff around out there. We'll share it here in just a second. We also want to make sure that every time we get together, we offer an invitation that if there's something we can do for you as you walk through your Christian life, as you go through your Christian journey, if there's something we can do for you, we offer an invitation. We're going to offer an invitation in a second. There's always an invitation when you go to church on Sundays to go to the... If, if you're here this morning and you're a kid, 
Look at the adults who brought you here. They took time out of their Saturday to bring you to this area, even if it's your mom, exactly. They took time out of their Saturday to bring you to this. If you have a question or care or concern, go to them because they love you enough to bring you to this event. And if there's something we can do for you, if there's something I can do for you this morning, I'm going to stand up here right now. Sebastian, you're going to lead us in that invitation song. I'll stand up here and I'll be glad to talk to you or do, pray with you or do whatever I can. Uh, but, but you're welcome.